In this video, it's part two of Ambassador versus Princess, and this time it's the turn of the Austin Ambassador. Before we get too carried away, um, I'm just going to break out because I've got an unusual opportunity to address um, a few errors in the Princess report. So we'll just go and do that. Corrections then. Um, first one was the gearbox. Um, I was wrong, it's a Borg Warner unit down there. It does not share its fluid with the engine. Um, as people notice there are two dipsticks. So that one's for the engine and that one's for the Borg Warner gearbox, uh, which is still down there um, beneath the engine, but not sharing the oil. That was only done on the AP transmissions used in the Minis, Metros and BMC 1100s. Oh, and the struts, uh, the hydraulic struts um, or gas struts are entirely correct for this vehicle. Inside, um, I was right, this button does check the brake fluid. It just doesn't work. It's all been disconnected. And uh, the panel lights switch is what this is, not cruise control. And there's different levels of brightness. So when you've got the lights on, it changes the level of brightness, which obviously we're not gonna see um, with it being dark, but um, that's what that's about. And there's apparently clever fiber optics to light up these switches and also these switches over here, all illuminated effectively by one bulb. Just use fiber optics to spread the light around. Oh, and another geeky detail. Um, this has had continental stalks fitted. It should have indicators on the right. Again, owner's personal preference. Uh, if he's gonna drive the car, that's entirely fair enough. And um, on the mileage, uh, this car has gone round the clock. So that's 103,000 miles. So with the corrections out of the way, we, we can move on to the Ambassador and take in the Magnificence. Uh, this is the um, effectively the replacement for the um, Princess. It's the final facelift, a huge amount of work. Um, we've got um, a completely different front end, which ties it in with the Morris Atal. I'm not sure that's desirable, but that's what it does. We've got the um, new Austin Rover logo as British Leyland is put to bed and um, becomes Austin Rover. That's the sort of the new logo of the 1980s. In fact, it's repeated on the number plate, uh, which is a, a lovely detail, Austin Rover. And it's got Unipart because um, that was the parts business and uh, supplied all the parts for these cars. And you'll note the main difference between Ambassador and Princess comes at the rear, where we have an extra side window for starters, and of course a hatchback. And um, again, the Austin badge here. And, and this is top of the range. This is the Ambassador Vanden Pla extra plushness. We've got a rear wiper, of course, as well. Um, so a substantial reworking, and it's said that the only exter external panel shared between this car and the Princess is the front door skin. Everything else has been tweaked in some way, maybe subtly, but you know, the roof line still kicks up slightly at the rear. Uh, so that detail is kept. But all this work for a car that was on sale for two years, 1982 to 1984, when this example was built, uh, it's just quite astonish astonishing really and kind of indicates just how broken the company was. It just didn't really know what it was doing. And really this was a desperate attempt to just eke a bit more life out of the design before it was ultimately replaced by the Maestro and Montego jointly between them. Um, also av available in pl pl plush Vanden Pla form. So it's quite fitting really, the Wolseley uh, 2200 was top of the range. Uh, this is uh, the top of the range Ambassador. Uh, the only difference is we've got a four-speed manual gearbox here compared to the three-speed automatic of the Princess. Uh, you could get the three-speed ZF on these as well, but what you couldn't get was the six-cylinder engine. That was dropped shortly before the end of Princess production, I think. Might have even been the late 70s, so it might even have been a few years before the end. And now we've got the O-series engines, which were introduced on the um, Princess 2 and also the Morris Marina 3, I think it was, um, 
also got the O series engine, which is an overhead camshaft version of the old B series really, but you know, reworked a fair amount. A much shorter engine, which means the bonnet line could be reduced. So oddly, the windscreen wipers are now visible. Uh, that's um, progress apparently, um, because there is no huge tall engine to accommodate. So yeah, now it can be lower. It gives the car a bit of a fresher look, I think. Uh, it certainly looks very, very 1980s. And um, just taking the other side, it does look the same over here as well. So the only options engine wise were the 1.7 or two liter O series engine. Uh, on the, these top spec models, um, the two liter engine comes with twin carburettors and puts out about 104 brake horsepower, I think. So it's not far off the power of the 2200. Uh, the six cylinder engine, though obviously it doesn't make quite the same noises. Uh, we should probably have a poke under the bonnet, I think, to start. So there we go, there is the new O series engine, very clearly an overhead camshaft design. Uh, this is the front of the engine, if you like, so that's where the timing belt is rubber timing belt driving the camshaft. Uh, spark plugs very accessible, the distributor cap is right here. Whether they suffer in the rain, I'm not sure. It's not raining, I can't tell you. But uh, there we go, Unipart, stickers. This car is in exceptional condition. It's in exceptional condition now. It wasn't always. Uh, this being the very last car, it was sold to uh, British, well, it wasn't sold to British Land. It was given to the uh, British Motor Heritage Trust. Um, which kept all the significant ve vehicles from British Leyland's history. It was set up to protect those cars specifically and stop the company selling them off in desperate times. And um, really, the early 80s, pretty desperate times. So this car was kept. It was actually used for the first three years of its life and it clocked up 11,000 miles, but it never had its first MOT, which would have been due at three years. Um, instead, um, it, w it w went off to the collection and um, was just put into storage. But in the early 2000s, the um, museum underwent a bit of an overhaul and uh, they wanted to clear out some of the old stock. So they put this car up for sale and it was bought for auction for around 2000 pounds. And for whatever reason, the next owner just kept the car on his driveway and uh, it sat there, it rotted away or and uh, filled with water and it was a very sad sight i mean it, it was it was fairly um, easy to see so there were, there were photos of this car that i have seen of it looking very sad windows got broken it was covered in a tarpaulin it was all very very sad uh, thankfully um, when the um, owner decided to scrap the car because he thought it was now so broken um, the scrapyard contacted the leyland princess uh, enthusiast club uh, whose sticker is proudly displayed here on the back and they were able to save the car and uh, Martin has um, been able to restore it he says the interior which we'll look at in a moment came up really well and uh, I think it's had a new headliner but the um, all the seats and everything cleaned up so he was able to save the originals which is magnificent uh, there has been some paintwork I can just see a bit of a welding repair on that back arch, very standard. Um, the bonnet is a slightly different shape because it has been repainted, as is the sunroof panel. But um, yeah, now Martin's got the big question, how far do you go um, in restoring such a vehicle? Um, because, you know, the paint may be slightly faded here, you can really see it here, how faded it is compared to the original because it was just left sitting outside. But um, yeah, do you lose the originality by respraying it? It's, it's not an easy call and I don't envy Martin in this situation. Uh, the gearbox um, here is, well, sorry, that's the clutch. Drives down to the gearbox. The gearbox is in the sump. It is in the sump on the manual ones. And that's also why it's still a four speed gearbox. Four speed gearbox, not particularly great for this era, to be honest. Most cars were up to five speeds, especially something that was purporting to be a bit executive here in your posh van den Pla. But you know, a, a very spacious engine bay, very easy to work on. And the bonnet struts, someone commented um, that they didn't think the bonnet struts on the Princess were original. They are. They actually had struts from new. 
So yeah, it's, it's all a bit posh here. I was hoping these were going to be door pockets, but they're not. That's just a bit of carpet on the door. Um, there's some wood, not particularly great wood, it has to be said. Maybe it suffered a bit with the outside storage, but I don't think it was all that grand when new. We've got the same door handles you would later see in Metros and Maestros and Montegos. And um, yeah, a dashboard which is completely different from the Princess. Entirely reworked to look much more 1980s. Here are the seats that have been um, restored. And uh, well, they haven't been restored, they've just been deep cleaned. And you know, there's a little bit of grubbiness in places, but it's the original seats. And uh, I love that Martin has been able to save them. Uh, I shall just jump aboard, if you'll permit me. There we go. Very, very comfortable seats. Not quite the same softness as the um, Princess, those super plush armchairs. But yeah, here we go. Look, still only 13,900 miles on the clock. No rev counter. We get an econometer. I'll try and show you that in action. Um, I mean, it doesn't really do much. Uh, we've got more modern storks, which would again be shared with the Metro. Uh, not used in Maestro and Montego. Um, I think these storks were used in the Land Rover as well. And the Reliant Fox, I can tell you. And a bank of extra switches down here. Fa fairly accessible. Nice loud indicator noise means Martin hasn't had to um, upgrade to the bleep. The bleep in the Princess was not an original item. Martin has fitted that because the indicator relay is so quiet, it's very easy to drive along not realising you're indicating. Especially as the self-cancelling doesn't always function as you'd hope. We've got little um, adjuster knobs for the um, door mirrors there. That's quite good. A digital clock. I'll show you the digital clock. There we go. It is 1151, triplex laminated windscreen. And um, yeah, th there's what the um, dashboard looks like. Uh, we'll start the engine up momentarily. There is a modern head unit in here because Martin believes in using his cars and he likes to actually listen to music. Uh, you'll note we've got electric windows in the front, cigarette lighter, heater controls, which are buried all the way down here. They're a bit of a stretch away. It's not particularly easy to get to. So that's not great. And the um, four speed gearbox. Look at that. Very obvious there's no fifth. Got a lift into reverse. And it has to be said, this is not the best gear change in the world. It's um, a bit ponderous, a bit clunky. Um, it, it, it's not up to spec for what people would expect from the 1980s, to be honest. But nonetheless, it's still light and airy, perhaps more airy because you get the extra side windows at the back so that's a big blind spot gone uh, makes visibility so much better although you still can't see where the rear bumper is nor the front bumper to be honest it's um it's, it's ahead there somewhere now one thing i will say in the back is close the door that's a much more reassuring noise that sounds an awful lot better uh, keep fit windows in the rear i'm afraid they never got around to fitting electrics um, but you know a decent amount of leg room uh, we've got uh, map pockets here as well and you know with a seat set for me there's um, enough room for my legs and you'll be very pleased to notice no knees so um, that's good news as well but it feels a lot lighter back here um, less enclosed than in the Princess. The, the headliner is sagging a little, but um, it does scoop up just here to give a bit of headroom because obviously it needs to clear the sunroof mechanism. But yeah, it, it's a nice place to sit. I don't much like these fixed um, head restraints um, that they were carried over to the Montego. And really it's just, that's not gonna do me any favors in a rear ender, is it? I mean, they're just absolutely pointless. But the big difference on this car, is the boot so let's go and check that out we've got central locking on this example as well and obviously compared to the princess that's a vast improvement uh, you have to do the um, parcel shelf yourself but um, you got the same size boot as on the princess but obviously now it's much more accessible and the rear seat folds uh, it's just a one-piece rear bench but that makes it more practical as well. You can get much larger items in. You're not restricted by this hatch. That, oh, ah, that's a nice feature. Wow. So um, yeah, you've got little levers here. That was also used on the Rover 800 Fastback. You'll notice a very standard Austin Rover 
um, light there and some rear speakers. So that's a really useful feature. I don't know why we don't see that anymore on cars. Um, most of them you're fiddling around at the back. And um, yeah, I like that. That's a good feature. If only there was a magic cable to make it pop back up again. But yeah, it certainly does change the rear aspect of the car enormously. Practicality is king. I'm just going to take a moment to admire these alloys as well. And behind these front alloys lurks a four pot caliper, which is a much better way of doing things than um, sliding calipers. Uh, unfortunately, many a princess or ambassador died for its brake calipers. They were very popular with people hotting up capris and whatnot back in the day. But I think that's enough prattling on. We should go for a drive. Now you can hear an Austin Ambassador in the background. The thing is, it's a different one. We've had a substitute, so this is why. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the red one I was driving developed an auto choke fault and the choke wouldn't turn off and it just sutted up the plugs and refused to work anymore. So that was the end of that. So the good news is, it's an Austin Ambassador. Why reg, why reg? John Shuttleworth fans will be pleased. That's, this is a 1982. It is also a Van den Pla. Uh, it's running at the moment. I'm just warming the engine up. It's quite noisy where I am. There's a railway in the background. It's all good. Um, it's beige inside, but it, overall it's mostly the same effect. Uh, uh, same trim level, uh, the Van den Pla. Uh, it's got the two litre twin carb engine. And um, the big difference is it's an automatic and um, the other thing I'm very pleased about given what happened yesterday if we just um, enjoy a lot of beige is the manual choke conversion that the um, owner Lee has fitted and um, there we go that is the choke fully home apparently They still don't idle well, do they? It has to be said. But he's, he's, Lee has got the original um, cassette player down here. That's a lovely thing to see. And the gear selector looks very different from the one in the Princess, but it's exactly the same. You move it over to select the different gear positions. Uh, it's just a, a new handle. But um, yeah, otherwise it's just like the other Ambassador, but more beige. Uh, someone, oh, that's the owner, Lee, <laughs> waving at me. Uh, as he drives past. I'm just going to put the fan on because we've got a bit of misting up going on and we'll see if we can clear that before we go for a drive but I'm just going to get the um, camera set up. One thing I will say, uh, I'll, I'll have a close look at the motor uh, wipers in a minute, there's no intermittent or mist function, oh there is a mist function, there we go, you just have to be really brutal with it. Um, so that's what's going on there, we can see a tiny triangle of doom up here don't quite overlap but the interesting bit this is interesting believe me is this has the original pin type wipers uh, these weren't fitted to the red one it just got the the later type that just clips on um, so this pin type very very common on Austin Rover products and now a complete nightmare to get the correct wiper blades for we'll go and have a look at the back one as well oh yeah that's on a pin as well but like I say, this type of blade, now very hard to find. So well done, Lee. I'm fully approving of that. Right, I think that's enough prattling on. Let's see if we can drive this one without it going wrong. Idling nicely. Got the fan running on a gentle setting. Oh, no, it's not as gentle as that setting. There we go. We are now ready for action. Uh, I've just re been reading um, Lee's notes, uh, which are plentiful. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to focus on those, but it's another one that's been saved from the scrapyard. Uh, these um, cars are so unloved. I mean, it's only got 39,000 miles on the clock. Uh, but yeah, so many ended up in scrapyards. There we go, we're into second. The con gauge is into the middle. Oh, it does well over these speed humps. I'm just going to operate the rear wiper because I can. Oh. I will get you some footage of that, don't you worry. Oh, yeah. Coming from the um, City Rover. Oh, this is um, 
much more like it. The steering is, um, yeah, as light and vague as I remember from the Princess. It seems a little notchy on this. I wonder if the pump is past its best or maybe the um, rack is um, suffering a little wear over. You'd hope not at 40,000 miles, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, let's do wipers. There we go. Just this slight triangle of doom um, issue, as I say. Uh, bring it to a halt, nice and easy. Four pot calipers on the front. And of course, the main thing you notice compared to the Princess is it's not making a nice noise anymore. Uh, this um, overhead cam engine is um, more efficient, so it's producing almost as much power from 2 litres compared to 2.2. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not a nice noise anymore. It's just a very ordinary four-cylinder noise. And um, unfortunately, it's been accompanied by many a trim rattle, which is sadly something these do. This dashboard is much more 1980s Austin Rover and um, sadly not just in terms of styling um, the build quality I mean I remember these sort of issues my dad's Montego it's just oh I am British and it does depress me that we apparently can't do a better job than this and the sunroof trim panel is rattling a bit as well but I'm so glad this car has been saved I'm so glad both cars have been saved of course the red one is the very last ambassador this is slightly earlier, but I can't see an awful lot different. Um, I do note that actually this has blanking plugs uh, where you think they might fit electric windows for the rear. They were never available. The later one I drove, that panel had been reworked. Um, apparently that was done like a few months before the end of production. And you have to ask yourself, what on earth were they thinking, really? I mean, turning the Princess into a hatchback was a very costly effort and it was several years too late. And all that effort for a car that was on the market for two years, but even close to the end of production, they were changing bits of trim. I think these vents might actually be slightly different as well. It just, oh, the mind truly boggles. Please don't pull out in front of me, thank you. And all those trim rattles, do detract from the fact that these cars ride so well and uh, the hydro gas suspension isn't quite up to hydro pneumatic standards but compared to a lot of its rivals this car rides much better it's a nice torquey engine it's got an, a nice amount of grunt so um, at least you don't have to work it hard whereas the princess with that 2.26 cylinder that didn't seem quite so abundant in its torque levels oh dear What a symphony, a symphony of crap plastic. If you turn the cassette player up, uh, maybe you can drown out some of the plasticky rattles. Does it actually work? Not awfully well, no. Oh, shame. If you'd paid extra for the top of the range and it made noises like that, I think you'd be quite within your rights to feel a bit disheartened but then it all stops as soon as you're away this gearbox seems much more quiet than the one in the princess but I should point out the princess has done over a hundred thousand miles and I doubt it's had a gearbox rebuild in that time so maybe this is more of an example of what these gearboxes are actually like But yeah, that's... That's not really the, the pleasant, screaming, creamy six-cylinder engine soundtrack of the Princess, is it? And we'll, um, we're just going to do a quick blast on the A38 and see how that works out. Let's just try a kick down. Yeah, that is loud. I mean, that's not even quiet. It's um, quite vocal. But 
the automatic has one advantage, but you don't have the clunky manual gear change. Yeah, just the free speed, it is um, revving high, I'd say. I can't say how high, because um, Austin Rover refused to fit rev counters to the Ambassador. We're just about hitting 70 and um, that sounds like about three and a half thousand revs. That's not what you call relaxing. Oh, and it's booming now. I've put my foot down to get past this Kia. Yeah, on light throttle, it's not too bad. And um, there's a bit of wind noise going on but um, now the ride is floating in a way which is most comfortable, but yeah. Jumping from the Princess to this, I think you're only gonna be disappointed. And the manuals weren't necessarily any better, well, they were a bit better, but because they were only four speed, they never managed to adapt a five speed gearbox to these cars. So overall, this has a vibe of the most disappointing words you can see on your um, school homework, must try harder. And I think they did because the Maestro and Montego, while a long way from perfect, were a lot better. They were actually rivals and realistic rivals in their class, whereas I think by the early 80s, this is just, this isn't good enough. And it pains me to say that, because you know, I love every car, but I don't think I would want to spend too long blasting up motorways in this. It's a lot noisier than my City Rover. And that's not a measure you ever want to be measured against. The owner has said he's happy for me to do a 0 to 60 test, so um, I think I rather should really. Here comes the gap, just wait for it and nail it. And to be honest, I think we'll stay at 60. It's a lot more relaxing at 60 than it is at 70. So there we go. That was the Austin Ambassador. And um, it has to be said, out of this head-to-head, -head, um, well, this scores heavily for practicality compared to a Princess. I think overall, it was the Princess that really won my heart. That straight six engine, the more retro styling, um, e even the interior. Well, this is a smoother interior. It shudders and shakes like anything else. So I think the earlier car wins. Um, but that said, just because I didn't come out loving this car doesn't mean, A, I wouldn't own one because I plainly would because I'm pathetic. And secondly, it doesn't mean I think it's terrible and deserves to be scrapped. I'm really pleased that people look after these cars. I'm pleased that people look after any car. So um, yeah, it, it's really good to see one of these preserved, well, to see two in this video preserved. And um, yeah, fair play to the Leyland Princess Enthusiast Club for keeping such cars going. Um, so I shall say, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go. Don't forget you can go to the shop and support Hubnut with all the um, Hubnut goodies and merchandise and support options. And uh, yeah, there will be plenty more videos on remarkably mediocre cars to come. Farewell. You didn't think I'd forget, did you? So I'm sorry it's taken so long to get this um, part two together. First of all, I managed to completely lose the files the first time I filmed the Ambassador, and then the second time it didn't want to play, so I've had to find another Ambassador. Uh, but it was only yesterday that the first one 
failed to proceed. So, um, but we're not all that far behind. But um, yeah, it's a, a shame it's ended up like this. But it did allow me to go and get those corrections. Uh, I don't like making mistakes, but you so often do with history. There's so much to consider, and um, I'm afraid I don't script anything. It's all off the top of my head. So I try and cram and do my research, but I do make mistakes occasionally. Like saying the Renault 21 was designed by Bertoni when it clearly isn't. It's Giugiaro, my favourite styling house. Why, why did I think it was Bertoni? Is that, ugh. And once you've made the mistake in a video, you can't go and edit the video back. So, um, unless you spot it in the edit suite, which I didn't with that one. Very annoyed. I've been pumping out the videos um, quick and fast. Uh, quick and fast, there you go. Um, recently. But um, yeah, sometimes my mouth noise gets the better, better of me. I say silly things like quick and fast. Probably meant quick and dirty, that's my editing style. <laughs> 